Hi, this is Biffle Cup with the Try Hard Podcast. This is episode 18 with Canada's Sega Funky Queen Game Genie Sokolov, with featured music also by Game Genie Sokolov. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> All right. So a bit about myself. Well, my name is Adelaide. Um, I'm a French Canadian. I'm from Quebec. live in Montreal for 13 years now, I think. Canadian citizen. Came from France before. Well, what do I do? I do cheap tunes, music, on a project called Game Genie Sokolov uh, that, uh, for, I don't know, four or five years now. I, don't re- I can't count it anymore. So I don't really remember when it all started. I've had... Uh, an EP out, a couple of albums out, and uh, this summer I've been playing everywhere. My latest album called Transmission that was released back in April. I think I, I played 16 shows this summer. <laughs> so, no, for real, I, I think that's the, the official number 16. Because of COVID and shit, you know, we couldn't actually oh, yeah. get on tour or anything. So that was a very good alternative. 
and yeah, that, that was a fun moment. I even played for Boston Navy, I think. So, yes, yeah. in July, you did. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, when I say everybody, you know, I just I tend to forget. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, what prompted the move from France? Oh, man. I don't know. I was 20 at the time. Uh, I came from a small village in the Celtic part of France called Brittany. And uh, it was fine, but, you know, living in a small village in uh, mm. Western Europe might not necessarily be the place uh, <laughs> to be if you want to seek a new adventure, something different in your life, access to culture, mm. or more generally more acceptances uh, from people because you are LGBT, uh, which was the case. So Montreal actually uh, was a possibility during my studies. So I moved there and I stay there. So, yeah, that's my uh, hometown. <laughs> that's my home base so i had actually I, I wanted to interview you this is a semi-new podcast we're like on episode 20 and yeah. you had been kind enough to uh let us feature your music so i featured your music so i was like oh maybe she doesn't want me to hit her up <laughs> for an interview but so what happened was was i made a tweet and i said last week uh i had a really dry week for podcasting nobody wanted to talk to me yeah. and so i said we asked a synth wave artist a rapper a drag queen and a gay Massachusetts politician leading Trump pride and no one felt like talking to us. So, and then I asked anything interesting going on in chiptunes that we can examine. And you said, I'm a gay drag queen, transgender chiptune synthwave artist. That's bilingual, a radio host too, <laughs> and loves hip hop. I can yeah. combine a lot of stuff in one place. And I said, well, yeah, so whatever you, whatever questions you had for all those people, just fire up. I can try. <laughs> Well, so what is all this? What do you so tell me all about this? I don't know. I, I don't okay. even know where to start with a question. <laughs> okay, so first gay. So the concept of gay generally a guy that loves another guy, so that's it. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now people, if you didn't know about this, well, it's 2020, get on with the time. Uh, or turn on Netflix, any series. Uh, <laughs> you will see example of it. Or just be cool and you'll see a lot of people like that around. You. Um <laughs> No, yeah, the fact, yeah, radio host here in Montreal. I did that for a very long time. Um, actually, uh, yeah, since 2005 to 2017, I think I was on the radio from France to here, college radio, uh, semi commercial radio, stuff like that, for a lot of programs that were sometimes a little bit stupid, like comedy, but sometimes there was a musical program or even a history teaching uh, program there was once. That was cool. So, yeah, I did a lot of radio and uh, I know how to hold a microphone for a very long time saying nonsense <laughs> for, for a very long period, you know. That's the thing. Otherwise, well, drag queen, yeah, I did that a couple of times, um, especially uh, at Halloween at first and uh, stuff like this. And now it's, um, now it's a bit more different because... Um, since uh, late last year, I've transitioned to female. And so um, now I haven't had the opportunity, you know, to uh, do drag since then. But maybe in the future, when COVID will go away, if it goes away, <laughs> hopefully. How are you holding up yourself, man? Um, well, I'm in the US and uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know for sure what's going on in the other countries, but the news are telling us that everyone else is handling it much better than we are. So... <laughs> <laughs> do they <laughs> that's that's what our own media is telling us and, I, and honestly i believe it it's a very exciting time here in the u.s and uh sometimes it's hard to just see like one day in front of you i don't know it is actually it's the same here you know up north yes uh, we have troubles with it too the, it changed the musical landscape a lot oh i know it what would you have done because you did just release a uh album uh transmission and yeah. so you had to br you had to like do this with COVID. What would you have done if it had been normal? Well, it was it was finished before. You know, it was finished uh, three or four months before, because this time there was some PR involved, uh, and uh, so I had we had to prepare that in advance. So I think at the at the end of 2019 it was pretty much done. Um, I don't know what I would do different playing live in front of people. I was starting to rehearse a lot. Uh, I haven't even built, you know, a portable gear uh, with everything, a, a rack with synthesizer and a Wi-Fi controller, you know, to, to play my own monitor mix. There was supposed to be a drummer uh, playing live along quick tracks, some visual. We, we prepared all that and then suddenly it was, it was over. So... Um, 
I could have postponed the album, but I decided, no, you know what, let's do it anyway. And then actually some radio, some local radio and media talked about it uh, because it was a unique aspect and because people, I think, needed that. Mm. In not, not my album, but people need music in general these days because we are stuck at home. So we need creative outlets or anything, um, you know, creative to kind of feed us. Otherwise, we're going to get crazy uh, It's staying at home, especially if you can work from home or if you sadly are unemployed right. uh, because of COVID even more. That, that would be even more insane. So we need people said, yeah, but should I do music? Should I release, you know, my art, my film or want to get some attention in those tough times? And there wasn't just COVID. There was uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. There was the election in the United States and in other countries. Um, so a lot of people, people say, you know, I met a lot of people in the Egyptian community saying I shouldn't release anything these days because it's not appropriate. And I disagree with that sentiment. I think this would be especially appropriate this day because we we need to focus on something else. Mm. Music is innocent enough, especially in chip tune because it's instrumental. So if you can just use it, if you just put it out, it would be better for everyone involved. Oh, you had said that. So you had said that you played 16 shows mm -hmm. this summer and... I see you hustling. I see you working. And, you know, maybe you didn't know all these contacts right away. So tell us about like how you were able to, in a COVID world, kind of like book all these shows, get to meet all these people. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you knew them beforehand, but, but uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, some of them, yeah, especially Rob from Boston 8-Bit. I mean, it was especially fantastic. He invited me for the Boston 8-Bit showcase in the PAX East last year. Mm -hmm. That was a very, very good experience. And I enjoyed actually meeting him. He is a very sweet guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was Emily from the 8 Static Festival in Philadelphia and all the crew, uh, Chris and, and everybody that um that i've actually met and uh, i even slept at her house once no. and, uh, <laughs> yeah a long time ago it was very very nice i met a lot of people like joey and uh, a lot of artists like uh, roboctopus or nanod they were very very great so i knew them so suddenly everybody was trying to to uh, hub their twitch game suddenly during the start of the pandemic a lot of people just realized you know we can do podcasts nowadays we can do our shows uh, live so everybody did it for three or four months everybody got involved i just put on a message i say hey who here has a streaming concert stuff or anything at all say so just contact me a lot of them did so i say yes to everybody <laughs> and then i i followed the shows they were doing and uh, then I, I can see sometimes they were cross promoting other shows so i contacted everybody just everyone i i, I gave shows to everyone that uh, wanted them so it was 16 records. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I loved your set. I love, I don't know, to me, it's so like, it, the setting is like very sexy. It's like dark, the lights. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about like setting up your, maybe is it your bedroom? I don't know. No, it's not. It's a, it's a little recording studio. Oh, and, wow. Um, yeah, but it's very small, you know, just a corner room that was uh, impractical for anything. So, um yeah, it just painted all black, uh, all the walls are bass traps. There's some kind of isolation uh, pad foam like, you know, uh, on, on the walls. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, just a black room pretty much. So there's colored lights. Uh, there's just a, a PC desk with a couple of very hodgepodge assembly of uh, electronic instruments. <laughs> None of it modern, you know. <laughs> I have a rack mount tape deck, you know, in front of me right now. You know, who has that? What's the point? So I use that. No, it was all built for, for a long time. You know, it was a small project to keep me occupied. And it was pretty much achieved during the pandemic because I got time on my hand. And then, okay, I just started recording. I don't even have Repcam, you know, and even to this day. I'm still using two very old uh, cell phones. I tape them on uh, mic poles. Oh, for wow. real. I press record and then I have to resync everything on Adobe Premiere because I, I'm too cheap to buy a web. <laughs> <laughs> That's, so the result is always very low-fi quality, but somehow when you add the noise reduction, there's a lot of ghosting coming on the picture. So it gives a lot of a very nice dramatic lighting effect. It's not necessarily... Uh, you know, something I looked for by design, but it happens. So, you know. So I was telling you, um, like in our previous chat, like from these live stream performances that I've seen you, it's like, 
Yeah. I don't know. You give me this very like mysterious it girl, like who <laughs> is she kind of like vibe. I'm like, who is this person? She's very interesting. She's very cool. But, but so, <laughs> and I strongly encourage people to check out your live stream and see what I'm talking about. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but um, like outside of that, so what's like, what is, what is real life like for you? So tell me like, if I went up to Montreal, like what, what would it be like spending a day with you you know what i mean like oh a day with me uh well nowadays nothing because i work from home i barely get out and uh -huh. i have to stay home because of the pandemic and stuff so it would be pretty boring so it would be working during the day seriously and then during the evening pretty much making music or playing any kind of video game with me roommates and my cat and, then <laughs> and smoking a lot of joints uh, uh oh yeah of course because you know plus side to live in montreal and not only is it legal but they deliver at home during the same day oh wow <laughs> so yeah i can tell you yeah marijuana consumption actually is sky high now because of the pandemic so <laughs> it's a very strange vibe in the streets <laughs> So these days, it's uh, pretty much uh, trying to do as much music as possible while transitioning and um, out of the public eye for, for some time. Mm. So, uh, the, the mysterious aspect is because, uh, you know, I, tr I don't go out a lot since I did, a, since I did started transitioning, especially this year. Um, because physically, I still have a dysphoria, you know, uh, hitting on me sometime because I think... Um, that I have to put a lot of effort into my physical appearances so that people clock me to the correct gender that I am. You know, I know a lot of people still talk to me as if I'm a guy physically, less and less, but they still do, and it kind of hurts. So the, the fact of, the pan of a pandemic, you know, making people staying at home, especially working from home full-time, actually helps me a lot in this uh, situation. So mm -hmm. every time I appear in a stream, I got makeup on. Uh, I, t I try to look as good as I can. I try to make good light thing you know it's, uh, you're just in my place so let's uh, let's at least show you uh, as it was as it would be but um, most of the time it's way more casual you know if you would see me without makeup you would probably think i'm less mysterious and <laughs> <laughs> you know than i should I, I am otherwise it's pretty much i think the the i don't know maybe the french aspect of it it has a mysterious vibe and the, that's uh, and because you know i'm uh, i'm making some tracks and cheap tune that no one else does uh, maybe that's what it is because it's very diverse so i, I think that might play a bit mm. i'll ask you two questions they're kind of the same question um, <laughs> okay <laughs> so go on <laughs> <laughs> so uh okay so the first question is if if you'd like tell us a little bit about your dysphoria experience and then the second question is like, you know, I was saying that I view you in a certain way from what I've seen from the live streams, but how, like, how do you view yourself? Uh, me as a female, David, and uh, that's, uh, that's it. That's pretty much all this to it. And uh, sadly, I was born in the wrong body and it took me some time actually to um, find the help of medical professional to actually you know start evolving in the right direction uh, and that takes time mm. so this is where i am i finally uh, admitted that to myself and to the to everyone uh, this year so um that's it you know you know this for you, it's very, very different from one person to another i won't divulge too much on how exactly it works on me because it's um this is a personal question otherwise it's not necessarily an easy thing to live by. This is pretty much the, the main thing that uh, that people that are in the process of transitioning are fighting against. So um, yeah, that's pretty much the main thing. I want to talk about your album. I just have one more question because something you said kind of uh, struck me. Ah. So, um, you know, I'm LGBT myself, or gay rather, and- um... Yeah! <laughs> And, um, and Jewish. <laughs> and Jewish. <laughs> oh my, man, that's a lot. <laughs> what your mom will say. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, David, he was great, you know. You should have seen him with this, his girlfriend at the time when he was six. Oh. <laughs> she still wishes. She, I know she, I see it in her eyes. She's still, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but so, um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As um, someone who, you know, I'm in Boston and and uh, I'm 33 now. I just turned 33. So <laughs> when I was growing up, 
you know, there was this movie that was really influential to me called The Believers. I don't know if you recall that movie. Um, um go, go on, maybe. Um, so it takes place in France. So you have to imagine I'm like 16, 17, and I'm trying to figure myself out. Mm-hmm. And um, it's about this American who moves to France and uh, in the 60s. And he it meets this uh, boyfriend, girlfriend couple. And he moves in with them and they start a love triangle and it's very, you know, sexually driven and stuff like that. And I'm, so I'm thinking that this is my imprint of, you know, France is very like free and liberating and a place for an American to go and find romance and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. you're telling me that where you were, you wanted to leave, you wanted to, to get away from something. So I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, it's, it's it's like for every immigrant, you know, we all have a reason to to move to a different country. I don't know. It's just that uh, when I arrived in Montreal, I was 21. And suddenly it was exactly what I needed at the time. You know, that kind of vibe, that kind of creative vibe, the fact that everything was for once available, uh, that I had immediately a circle of friends. Uh, it's That was very quick. That that's still my friend to this day, um, and that I could manage to do whatever I want. Suddenly, I just said, you know, let's, you know, I did, uh, I want to do radio. Let's do that. And suddenly, you know, even if it's a small radio, you have quite an audience because it's a big city. So suddenly, you're something. Uh, I met a lot of great musicians. I seen a lot of great concert. Um, I've been part of the cultural and pol- political life. So this is suddenly, I am. It meant like I'm part of that community. And I'm definitely have ideas to, and now I think a strongly constructed opinion because I live here um, about the direction it should be in. So I decided to be part of that, uh, you know, community of interest. That's the the federal country of Canada. I'm much more Quebecers, you know, than Canadian. If you ask every <laughs> Quebecer, you will have the, <laughs> on a Quebecois, voilà. And uh, because also the, the actually added factor that because in Quebec it was speaking French, so it wasn't very difficult for me. It wasn't a bar- barrier language, mm-hmm. you know, f- for me coming here at first. Then uh, I started really learning English. Once I arrived in Montreal, I had only shadows of English, you know, coming from <laughs> school, some basic, basic, probably same as your French lesson, David, if you had some. <laughs> Did you yes. Have any? Uh, yes. I. Je parle français, mais uh, c'est, c'est mal. Vrai? C'est mal. Non, c'est pas mal. C'est bien. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> I want to practice more. You're helping me. You're helping me. Ah, bah, avec plaisir. You you will call me, and uh, I definitely be uh, be able to help. I know Dominique uh, Rambo Trash from <gasps> Montreal. She would be definitely uh, interested, you know, in uh, making a French-speaking podcast if you want to participate. Oh! And, uh, multi-memory controller, Dominique from uh, Montreal, uh, XC3 in uh, to, uh, from Montreal. There's a lot of us from Montreal. Oh, I know it. I know it. I, COVID-19. Oh, Boston too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody comes for free city. You know, it's Philadelphia, Boston, London, and Montreal. <laughs> That's it. And Paris. And you get the scene. Telling the game, chief. Back at it again, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Antisocial, loner, hermit. Whatever you want to call me, I've already heard it. A common misconception from other people's perception, but I just like to focus on personal introspection. I ain't shy. I can give a damn about how I'm seen, but y'all still don't get it, so here's the visor so you can see from my perspective. Ain't it's wrong with me, my mind is so ain't effective. I'm simply selected by what I choose to do, and I chose to chew the mic. But y'all quick to say that boy ain't right, cause I stay home and write instead of clubbing all night. And you think I'm living trife as a loner since you think I got it. They really think I got it. They really think I got it. When I say introverted, people hear shy. 
but that ain't really the case and I'll tell you why introversion is a choice shyness stems from the stress but I can't give a whole lesson here so I digress nevertheless I'm vexed cause people think I'm neurotic but if I was this mic right here I wouldn't rock it chalk it up the ignorance but I'ma keep it moving make your hot tracks a sock love to keep your speakers booming catch me at a festival show or open mic but most days I'd rather hone my craft and write in the studio putting down fire day and night but they think I'm living trife as a loner since they think I got Break it down one time. They really think I got, I got, I got. No. Well, I love you and I love Dominique. Uh, and I'm so like, I'm so getting into the Montreal scene. And another person who I've been obsessed with, who I did <laughs> not know was part of the Montreal scene was Gab Manette. Ah, oui. Oh my God. I love, I, I love him. I found him, uh, um, his album. It was very 80s mall. Like I, I love that uh, mm -hmm. aesthetic. If I describe Gab Manette as like having this 80s mall aesthetic what what kind of aesthetic would i do you think i i would s describe game genie sokolov with well he's uh definitely uh, gab manette is somebody that i really really appreciate his making waves album is really fantastic and really respected in the synthwave scene and this is well deserved this yes. is very, very good uh, his synthwave synth pop and uh, i think more vapor wave more on the chill wave kind of stuff you know very 80s chill that, that's pretty much what he does. Uh, in my case, it's a bit complicated because at, uh, at the core, there are still cheap tune because the main synth I use is still the, the Yamaha YM uh, 2612 from the Sega Genesis. Um, it's still my, uh, my basic instrument for everything. Uh, a bit of the pulse signal that you can find in the master system on the Game Gear just for adding a little salt. Uh, but nowadays it's more drum machine uh, and also a lot of guitars. So now I, well, uh, funk guitar, you know, always clean sounding uh, on top of it on some occasion and vocals. Mm. So now it actually expanded, but the sound is still chip tune. But the genre, it depends on the track. There were hip hop tracks. Uh, there's yes. R&B tracks are coming uh, and very good one at that. Uh, there was some synth pop song like Fio Garçon. There was Vaporwave, like for RGB colors, for example. That was straight up it. Synth pop, very 80s for a song like Coming Out. And sometimes pure chip tune uh, track, you know, like Contact or everything that are pretty much, you know, a 16 bit soundtrack. So it's very diverse. But since I do the, the, the production with pretty much the same tools, but in a different way, and I do the mixing myself. And I got a very, very good friend called Antoine Rotondo. Uh, that's a Grammy Award nominee that did the mastering. Wow. Of my previous project. He made that album sound as Korean as, uh, as it was. So, uh, because otherwise, just the rough mix of every track, you know, it was a, 
you know, going on every direction because it was so diverse, but we managed to create something coherent. So I don't know what it is that I do. It's, uh, I don't know. I do electronic music, if you want. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sega, I'm the Sega funky queen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Sega Queen, you know? Ooh la la, Sega Queen. You remember Space Channel 5? If someone got that plexiglass costume, 99.99, you know, send it to me. I'll buy it. <laughs> Promise. I'll open an OnlyFans because go and check my Instagram. You will see that I don't look like what you think I look right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the music, actually, David, is because when people listen to my tracks and then see what I look like, generally there's a kind of, uh, like, really? <laughs> this, that's surprising for everybody, especially women in shiptune for a long time because people thought that it was pretty much a, a guy club, and it, it was for a long time, let's say that. Um, but it was ever more diverse than what it was supposed to be, especially because we are, it's a community of outcasts at first, uh, you know, nerds. So uh, that's why you tend to find people that are really uh, tend to go beyond what people think about them and tend to be more free into their lives. So that's why it's such a nice community. It's because of the condition of why it exists. You meet people that have... Uh, struggles and it's very fine to live with them because they are much more original than uh, everybody's tradies you know you know yes I mean? in the chiptune community everyone's got their own like uh favorite instrument and and mm -hmm. sega is pretty i don't know i find it to be pretty rare that I've, I've seen it but it's pretty rare that someone um uses that as their main medium of of instrumentation tell us a little bit about being drawn towards that and uh, choosing that as your as your main medium well the, the nice thing about the sega genesis is because it has an fm synthesizer in it so th that's actually the uh, the sound i like uh, i like a lot of uh, sound of uh, mid 80s uh, record pop record because they are uh, and they use the fm synth uh, there was michael jackson there was prince uh, there was uh, pretty much everybody you know by any no queen yes um, Anybody just think about anyone if they had an FM synth in their sound. That was the thing. And it was an instrument that was associated for a long time, you know, with a cheesy sounding brass sound or stupid bells. It's but we are very overused <laughs> cliche sound. And that's right. But the thing is then Synthwave came along. And Synthwave actually showed that you can use a synthesizer or a drum machine or any element from the 80s and 90s and make them sound as fresh as it would be if they were coming out in 2020. But still, you know, have that kind of a timbre and sonar and sound, the, that tonal quality that come from the 80s, how's that? Because those guys were not born in the 80s. They were born way after, you right. know, they listened to Nine Inch Nails, they listened to Tupac, they listened to, uh, you know, Daft Punk and, um, the, you know, everything came. So now they have a different musical perspective in their mind. So you, if you give them that instrument, they would create new sound out of it. Nothing as what the cliche was like. So it's not sometimes, you know, to use it for cliche because, uh, you know, it's an homage and why not? You know, let's have some guilty pleasure. <laughs> sounds nice. And the Sega Genesis was not necessarily used as an FM synth for a long time. It was used as a Sega Genesis. So a lot of people made video game music a very highly technical music. And I understand why, because it's very nice you know to push a console that you love that has this very unique sound aesthetic and very diverse uh, in all the direction that suits your style i mean uh, the japanese game for example Re Re um, revenge of shinobi uh, oh, wow, of yeah. Rage, uh the sonic soundtrack sometimes sounded very very nice on the Sega genesis uh, some games uh, sounded terrible oh i have to say a look look <laughs> spiru the smurfs you know, the, the, the cheesy uh, MIDI, you know, 90s PC MIDI kind of soundtrack sound. That was exactly sometime what, what you could achieve that too with a Sega Genesis. And sometimes developers use that stock sound. And so that's why it sounded like shit. But, <laughs> if, but if you use it as a pop instrument, it can work too. So I, that's my approach. Um, at first, I used the Sega Genesis to do my own tracks. And then furthermore, I listened to you know, uh, uh, tracks by Prince and stuff that use that in a very different ways. But I, I was still doing cheap tune. Then I changed the drums. Then I changed, I added vocals. Well, it's evolving all the time. So now it still stays at the core because I can make it sound good for what I need to do. But maybe one day I won't use it at all. Uh, really? You know. Why not? You know, yeah. Because uh, I want to use NES a bit. 
uh, for some track, I'd like to try like Fami Tracker or some shit, you know. Maybe I oh yeah. Try. Or I can make the most worst sounding Sega CD soundtrack ever with tons of reverb and weak snare. Every <laughs> game at the time had a CD soundtrack that was... I kind of like telling this story because I think it's so funny. So maybe uh, 10, 10 years ago, I was playing Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Yeah. And uh, I was listening to the music and I said, oh, wow, Anime Gucci. Okay, this is who this band is. And I said, you know, I think there's really something to video game music and I was going to school for music at the time and mm -hmm. I just thought I had the, the most original idea it was the video game music and I thought I thought I'm a genius and then I come to find out I'm the last person in the room and I <laughs> And so, you know, I'm still trying, I'm still trying to climb the ladder and see if I can make some kind of dent. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about like finding uh, chiptune on your end. Well, I, I don't know. I've always listened to you. Uh, the, the Sega Genesis was a great console for me, especially because I couldn't, you know, put it on. Uh, the TV all the time mm -hmm. because I didn't have the TV in my room. So I had, you know, to go or uh, plug it on the TV on Saturday afternoon, play a couple of hours, then, you know, uh, dismantle everything and put it back in a box in my room. A lot of kids did that in the, in the past before, you know, they had DVD drive and they have to hook, yeah. you know, hook on the TV all the time because we had to disassemble the console from the TV. You know, it wasn't hooked, uh, you know, all the time. But the Sega Genesis has a good thing. There was a front headphone jack with a volume slider on the first model of the console. So you could just put on the cartridge, no picture. If you remember, uh, you know, the controller press to go to the sound test menu and then, you know, blindly, and then you can play the tracks. And then I did that. I listened to a lot of video game music tracks from the Sega Genesis this way with no picture, you know. <laughs> And some game had very, very deep bass. I mean, I, I remember Sonic 3 and everything. That was quite a difference. I had friends that had a Super NES. And yeah, of course, it sounded nice. But the thing that really hit me on the Sega Genesis was the bass. Mm. Uh, even to this day, it's one of the best bass in an analog-based uh, video game console chipset, sound chipset ever. So um, that was too bad. That that's why I've always got big bass in me tracks. You know. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about transmission. So you know, if I'm reading it very literally, so your your yeah. your album is called Transmission, and you've got tracks like Figonson, Lady Boy, Non Binaire. I don't know if I said that with the right pronunciation. Non Binaire. Non -binaire. Yeah, right. Hey, I got it. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> I'm doing good. Yeah, so. David, you're doing good. <laughs> Your so, mom would be so proud <laughs> if only her son wasn't gay. But, oh, oh, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. I'll grow out of it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't finish your meatball. Come on. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> oh, my God. From, from my dad's side, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what was your question? Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm if I'm you know reading it like that and it's you know very literal so tell us a little bit about this release and how how it reflects you well um uh, the, the album transmission was a collection of songs uh, well tracks and songs but it was I didn't have anything with it it just one day I just realized that I have 12 tracks finished and um you know with 42 minutes of program Let's and uh, they all had placeholder titles because I don't know about you, but every time I start a new musical project, I put a random words, so and that's the name of it. Like the latest track is called Cactus, and there's no reason for it to be called that way, <laughs> and it will stay as such until it's mixed. And then suddenly, I'm like, hey, wait a minute, do I want it to be called? <laughs> what, what do I want to call this? And generally, I just look around and spot uh, spot a word on a piece of equipment and use it. But on that case, you know, it just turned out that um, not consciously, uh, but I was telling way, way more during the lyrics and the song title than I what I wanted to say. Um, when it came out, uh, some of my friends knew uh, that I was transitioning. Most people didn't. Even the vast majority, in fact, didn't have a clue. So it, it was clear clue for everyone uh, at that time that there was uh, something going on in my personal life that was actually going, going in it. Uh, There's one track that I sing in that album, the only one way I do, 
uh, called Coming Out. It, it closes the album. Uh, in fact, I put them at the end of the album because I was, I'm still very self-conscious about it uh, because it's still very raw. You know, the, the, the first of all, the, the lyrics are in English, so it's not it's not my language. So I tried to you know, make something that didn't that wasn't too ridiculous. Um, and then I just realized, you know, that the lyrics are, are very personal. It really talks about something that really happened to me, even if it's in vague terms. Those are terms that I said mm. to myself. So it makes sense to me. So um, and I had to sing that. So then I realized once those tracks will be out that, you know, it, it would be hard to deny now. So it, it was helping me actually pushing myself out and um, also being free of constraints of what you should do, what you should not do, uh, how you want to do music, how you want to live your life, how you want people to refer to you and uh, how now you, you will uh, start a new chapter of your life that will be different certainly difficult in, more difficult in some parts definitely but also way more liberating mm. so um so definitely the the theme was into that album some especially if you look at the colors of the album you know it's the transgender flag colors uh, pretty much on the cover um but during the PR, uh, when the album came out, I didn't deny it, you know, at all. You know, people, I'd say, you know, it's literal enough. Can can we talk about the music? <laughs> the thing is that now, I, you know, it's a bit past. So I can say, yeah, okay, yeah, it was about it. But it was not, the, it just came out during, you know, uh, assembling a track list in the end and everything. There wasn't, you know, a big project of anything. There was just 12 tracks that needed a context. And in that context, with that title, it worked. You know, sometimes, you know, you, you can have good ideas because you, you need to have some pressure on you. So that's, uh, that happens to all of us. That especially with people that are do, for example, film editing, mm. or, um, album mixing. After a while, you have a cons- you have a time constant saying no, you have to deliver something on this day. So after a while, naturally, you will draw a line where it's finished for you. You see what I mean? Yes. So by doing those actions, uh, it actually helped me to draw myself a line. I say I got enough things to make them release, and now I will use that opportunity also to release something else. Also, s- some people in the communities t- tell me that I told me that if you put more of yourself uh, into your music, it will always be better. Yes. So uh, that's the thing. I was playing guitar; no one knew. And uh, after a while, some people told me, "You know, but put it on. You know, you that's what you do." Okay. Sometimes you sing, just sing a song. Okay. Uh, you like <laughs> hip hop, ask hip hop artists. Okay. So that's what I did. It was just a thing, you know, asking everyone, hey, I'd like to do a track like that. Are you on? And most of the people are on. So it was a very, very fine project. And I, I really loved everyone that uh, worked on it and everyone that managed to put the word out for it, especially uh, people from Boston 8 bit that did the virtual launch of the album. Um, it was the first Twitch broadcast, and there was a lot of uh, <laughs> how do we say technical difficulties? <laughs> Difficulty. <laughs> but that was a fun evening, you know. Looking back on it was so funny. You know, the same tracks playing four times. That, <laughs> that was fun. That was a fun evening. Rob was so nice. You know, it's a it's a part of Rob, and I mean that in a loving way. It's just like. It's... Rob and Jeremy, they were yeah. trying to fight Twitch and they, they managed in the end. Well, that was it. It's really? the best. It's the best.
I was watching you uh, on Dan Butler's stream today and uh, you know, you're on the keyboard, you're on the guitar, you're on this, you're on that. You got all <laughs> these different videos. <laughs> and I was thinking about, wow, how does she do that? Because in my group, so I'm a chiptune rap uh, violin group. And, you know, I always want to add another melody and I always want to add this and I want to add this line of music and that line of music. And then it just becomes too much. And I have to learn how to like edit. I have mm. to like edit. So do you, do you have that issue? And how do you, how do you deal with like editing? Um, in a chiptune, it's actually quite the easiest part uh, because you're limited by the number of channels that you have anyway. Right. So in the Sega Genesis, I have six channels. Uh, before I was only using five of them, but since now I'm using a drum kit, well, a, a drum machine. So now I have six tracks available of FM. So I can use, you know, one for bass um, and like a couple for lead sound and a delay, a detune effect. Generally, they go by pair. Odd, uh, a pad sound, a uh, very strange ev convoluted lead sound using free channel at the same time, especially if I want to have stereo. So, and I do channel switching. So sometimes I want to change my lead sound or it has to come out. So I have two channels, you know, freeing up. So now I can use them. And that's it. It's just because I'm limited. I want to have a sound design on a Sega Genesis that actually sounds huge and stereo. That's my main goal. Um, Sometimes I can use a mono track and pass it through, you know, a chorus, especially the CE2 chorus. That's really my go to one. Um, no reverb at all on your sound. A uh, lot of high pass filter on everything but the bass and the drums. On everything, just just go on and just and put them quite high, so that it will unglue your mix. And having a limited number of instruments available at the same time, and you have to switch to them, um, automatically it ends. You you reach the limit. There's nothing where you can go, and um, that makes you work to the essential, the melodies. You know, yes. after a while, if you realize, you know, that pat sound is it's good, but. You know, I, I want something in my track. So you can delete all the pad altogether and then add something else that will sound better. So that's the thing. You just limit yourself of, with three or four instruments and you you improvise on top of it. And after a while, it just comes um, and then you can create many sections. I don't know. It's never the same process depending on tracks. Uh, like the, the one you're referring to that you've seen, uh, the, the Synthwave Jam I did at home, uh, the first thing I recorded was the drum. Actually, uh, I did 10 minutes of uh, playing dr drums on nothing but a click track. Wow. Well, it's tedious, but at the same time, you know, I just put some notes on my uh, computer, like every 16 bar, or I just put a word, you know, like saying calm, waves, <laughs> uh, storm, reaching an island. Well, th that's where I put, you know, just to give me something to do. Then I put a bass on it. And then the trouble is when I had to uh, put some lead on the third track, I can't remember what I did on the bass and drum for 10 minutes. So I was playing everything blindly, you know, hoping that the chords will somehow match up. And it can work because you're jamming with yourself. So you, you may know in which direction you're going. But most of the time it didn't work. So I had to mute them. That's why on the screen you uh, I use VHS footage on everything just to, to simulate the, when I muted the original track. A lot of muting. Sometimes just go with uh, all your tracks and your full arrangement on your track. That I like to do. And then I mute everything. I just mute them. I just take the latest lead that I have, the bass line, the drum. And then I add some stuff and I remove mostly some stuff. So um, if you look at my multi-tracks, you can see that pretty much a third of my tracks are just fully muted from start to, to finish because it sounds way better like this. Mm. So, um, and also it's a Sega Genesis. You, you can't have it too crowded. Um, Use outboard gear, but no reverb. No reverb, people. You're using too much reverb. <laughs> Use delay and detune them, please. Not too much feedback. Not too much. Feedback. Tell me about that because I, you know, I, reverb's so funny. It's uh, I always hear when people are like critiquing music, they'll be like, "Oh, I wish there was a little bit more reverb on that." Tell me a little bit. Now I'm hearing the opposite from you. You're saying, "Pull it in, pull it in." Because it's a chip tune, you know. If you want it to be, um, there's no reverb available. It's ex except on the Super NES, of course. But the thing is that you don't have it, so you have to simulate tricks for. Uh, if, 
doubling you know leads with one slightly detuned uh, that generally helps but it takes two channel but it sounds way more full um, using three notes for a bass uh, so that you can then merge them together in mono you adjust their level and then you have a deep huge gigantic deep bass sound it uses three channels but at least it's there but you know it's huge this way so you know that there is going to be very less room for anything else mm. if you have to add it's because you have only three more channels available because of that. So it's it forces you to limit yourself. Reverb, most of the time I don't like to hear it. I like to feel it. It's nice to wet some um, some instruments, vocal, or create you know a more you know um, uh, how do you say that diffusion. Reverb is nice, but people generally, uh, there's too much bass in the reverb, you know, a lot of high pass and a low pass would be needed most of the time on the reverb. And then I love them because I want them to actually have some depth and to actually blur some part of the signal. But if it comes here to add blur to bass, there's already bass in there, you know, it doesn't need anything. It needs to be sharp. A high frequency, generally, you have something else coming, like a harp with a, a delay or something. So it's already occupied. So just use the mid range for reverb. Generally, it's nice this way, and it can actually occupy the space. But I don't want to hear it. I want to feel it. I want to see here as an extension of the instrument playing right. or the voice playing. But not something to smear. And add some pre-delay. Damn it, people. There's early reflection. It's not here for nothing. That's your cue. That's cool. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about blend, like blending, blending these um, uh, human instruments with like this electronic, this electronic sound. Mm. Uh, mixing the real instrument. Well, playing guitar, you know, that that's because I had one laying around. So I just tried. And also because a lot of people did that. I mean, the, uh, as I said, Prince was uh, is actually my main influence in the guitar world. I mean, he had a very clean sound, no effect, nothing. And he just plug it in on top of drum machine and very 80 cent. That actually sometimes are the same, which I'm using. Well, I'm using, you know, scaled down version that's found on the Sega Genesis, not necessarily the Yamaha DX7 synthesizer i wish i had one but it's very expensive and i don't have the room to put that beast around me right now <laughs> and uh, it's fragile so uh, sega genesis all the way but you hear it you hear that it was possible someone did it and did it with style and by using you know the the synth in a very subdued way so i tried that on some track for example like sky dance or ladyboy on the previous album and then it worked. You just realize, you know, if you use it as a rhythm instrument, not, you know, as a, something that should play a very fast uh, lead, like I heard on many cheap tune, uh, heavy metal uh, composition, and it works very well like this. I really appreciate them. I'm not a technical girl. I can't play fast. Um, but the thing I, I like and that I can play, I can play soul and I can play funk. Mm. So that I can put that, you know. So a way more laid back guitar with a very crisp, clean sound with a bit of chorus, no reverb, no delay, nothing, but, you know, being played on the background, it can add some attack to the track. Like this, I like because it, it's in the band, it comes to support. So I can't use lead guitar for that. So naturally it comes. Piano can work very well with chip tunes too, if you don't have, you know, a full bodied sound. Right. Um, if it's used, you know, as something that's not front and center and try to be a lead, you can't be a lead in an orchestra that's not in your style. You can try, but it will be very difficult and you need to uh, be an excellent producer or composer. And I'm sure there's a lot of you listening to it right now that managed to do it. And you have probably a lot of examples to send me in my uh, DM. <laughs> and I'd be glad to listen to it all. Please send me some music, people. I really, That's something. If you want to be friend with me, send me music. That's uh, <laughs> For real, that's the thing. Uh, uh, we can talk like this. <laughs> But, you know, having a, an instrument that's uh, real in a, and that takes the lead in a flow of instruments that are fake, you need to adapt your sound a little so that it actually blends in. So a lot of time spent into mixing. Uh, I don't really use EQ um, except low pass and high pass because I EQ, I overdo it all the time. Mm. So, um, now, the, the only idea to make it blend most of the time, I mix them in mono. Then I adjust the volume until, you know, it's it's at the place where it should be. And then I, I put it back in stereo. Maybe it will sound strange, but at least I know that's where it should be. 
So naturally, it gives you a different perspective when you do that. So um, that's how it happens. For singing, you know, uh, well, you, you were telling Anana Gucci, so of course, you know, <laughs> They are a very great example, but also in Canada, we had Crystal Castles. Oh, Crystal Castles, yeah. And that was a great example, you know, and especially since they did that track with The Cure with Robert Smith a long time ago. And that was, that was something huge for me. I say, okay, you can have Game Boy music and you can have Robert Smith singing on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Like suddenly you just say, it exists. We can. That's yeah. fine. Make music, people. Try anything. Experiments, you know. Just show people that it can exist, you know. <laughs> Polka chip tune is a thing, so you know. <laughs> How do you figure out? Because um, you know, I keep bringing it back to my to to me. So you know, it's I'm, nice. <laughs> so you know, I've got this. I don't know if I'm good or bad, my group, but I, you know, we are original. We're an original trio, and we yeah. have hip hop and violin and Game Boy, and so sometimes try hard, yeah. <laughs> And, <laughs> um, you know, when we play, um, you know, some people like us and then some people don't. That's fine. I don't I don't mind that. That's I like that. But, you know, sometimes I try and figure out, are we are we just new or are we bad? If like people don't immediately take to something new like that, or do they need time to adjust? I don't I don't know. What do you think? We we we. I don't think I can use my energy thinking about that in my case because whatever people think of your music is um, nonsense. It's it's not what's what's the, the mean of it to me. Of course, it's good to have some feedback and of course you want feedback. When you put your music out, it's not purely an act, you know, of uh, giving it to the community. It's also a bit for yourself. Uh, to ask for some form of feedback, you know, otherwise you would just record it for yourself, which yeah. is absolutely valid. But if you want some feedback, you have to be ready to accept that uh, for a lot of people, it's uh, the novelty aspect will always be part of it on their first impression and it will stay on this one. So um, for every genre that's new, you have some... Uh, for people you can have a reaction that's very strange especially if it's not a world that it used to nowadays electronic music is not the most popular genre in the world it's uh, definitely hip-hop um uh, or, or pop you know for that matters alternative pop more more and more these days electronic music is on the back burner so even if you're there and you show them that it exists some crossover with different genre that maybe those people are not necessarily aware of them still existing or being existing in such a big capacity. It could, the shock, the surprise of discovering your band, for example, or my music or anything, like uh, somebody like Rainbow Trash, for example, mm. uh, people might be shocked and um, they might not necessarily have the tools or the experience to know where to get that kind of music again, or they have to fall in love with it. So, um, and the second part is more rare, you know. So, building a community is very difficult. A lot of people will always call us video game music, and you know, that's fine. It's, uh, it's how they see it, it's cool. But once they are here, they are listening to the tracks and the production for what it is, whatever their bias is. Sometimes they can't go over it, and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm. So, it's always a terrible thing. Um, there's no shame, you know, of uh, being original. Because that way, at least people will remember you. Right. Well, I think about that. <laughs> because you say, hey, check it out. I mean, this, this is exactly the thing. People say, hey, check this out. I mean, this is, hey, that doesn't happen. Right. Like, it's not something we see every day. So, so that aspect is always good. Try Hard is a very good example of that. There was the, that band that I saw at PAX East that were actually uh, playing the whole Mega Man Free soundtrack uh, on a metal band. And there was uh, Speedrunner playing the game at the oh, same wow. time. <laughs> That was something awesome. Uh, you have the video game orchestra too. Oh yes, you know, they know that they are. They have a niche audience. Right. And it's fine. Do we have to do some fan service? No. Uh, do we have to do what we do? Yeah, because the more sincere we are, maybe it's gonna work. Maybe it's not gonna work. But this is not something you can decide. Right. Uh, you can't decide of what's gonna work. Of it's uh, will seize the zeitgeist. Probably not. 
uh, it will never actually chip tune be um, how can I say uh, it will not buzz around the planet you know it will not go viral uh, because it will never reach uh, the it will never capture the, the actual zeitgeist because it's old technology most of the time so um, it won't happen right but you can find people uh, that will actually facilitate the creation of a community uh some people like boston 8-bit for example a bit of chip tune yeah. and i tried fm uh previously there was chip win before uh and, and more community that you know like toy company in montreal that will uh, facilitate the organization of musician and of audience that's what should matter to us um me, I like what you do, but the thing is that uh, does it matter if I like what you do? You know, <laughs> what's matter if that is the band uh, when you release a track, proud of it and say, you know what, we can be seen with that, and that's cool, that's awesome. Right? Yes. You do you feel that yourself? I I love what I I love what I do, and I'm always proud of what I do. I don't know, but I I doubt too. Sometimes I doubt for sure. Like I'm like, oh, I don't know, am I? Am I doing, I don't know. Do you get that? Like, like you're proud, but then you think about it for a little while and you're like, maybe this is wrong. I don't know. <laughs> uh, some, t- some tracks are unreleased uh, because after a while you just tend, you know, I don't have fun. You know? Right. That's the thing sometimes, you know, uh, when I work on a track, I tend to finish them. I have very, very few outtakes. Um, I can delete most of the track and start a new but on, on the ground of this one so there's never any uh, any leftover track but some of them sometime i was just listening to it the following day and i just say nah <laughs> do i want to spend 20 hours fixing this no i don't want to so, because it's no fun <laughs> yeah that's the thing it's not fun for you do right you so do i want to put some energy in that and <laughs> seriously I, i'm 34 year old now I'll, uh you know I think I've wasted too many energy giving uh, too much of a fuck about some useless things during my youth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, nowadays I just say, you know what, let's roll with it. Those are fun times. Let's have fun. You know, that's <laughs> the best thing. I'm never going to be a superstar with Game Genie Sokolov and it's fine, but I can at least try uh, to collaborate with nice musicians and uh, see a lot of nice show and meet a lot of nice people in the... Uh, in different countries, such as you, for example, and many others that I met. So um, that at least gives me uh, gives me a lot of pleasure. This is where I found it. You know? Why not? I think you're a superstar. I think you're a superstar. No, I'm not. Yes. Come on, man. Yes. Have you seen my Spotify listen score? This is ridiculous. Oh, that can change overnight. That you. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's chip tune. It's not happening overnight. You know. It's, uh... <laughs> You had said, uh, you know, having music for yourself, that's valid. And you had also said that you like Prince a lot. And I was thinking about yeah. when Prince died, they found all that that safe of music that he had written and nobody mm. had heard. Do you have music for yourself? You know, you know well, I, I get a lot of projects that I did, you know, in, uh, in different bands, demos of garage band I was involved in. Uh, but it's never going to come out because it's old and that's uh, not necessarily the same style. And um, I don't even know if I still got them because I've moved a couple of times since then. I don't know if I still have the hard drive that got them. Mm. Maybe someone has, but it's not necessarily a great loss. It's still in my memory for some. Maybe the memory of it is better than the track itself. I think. <laughs> Do I... Yeah, but it's, it's always for myself. You know, it's uh, at first I want to experiment in some design. I say, hey, can I create a nice bass sound that go with this? And then I realize, hey, with that bass sound, uh, I actually can play this. Oh, it's fun. And let's have a sound that's like this, you know, that answers it. But that's not on the same frequency. The idea of the sound design in my case helps me during composition, you know, Mm. because I can make it not crowded. I can use sound. I like, okay, those frequencies are occupied. I need another instrument for flourishes. Let's create it, you know, with the FM synth so that it actually fills only that void and not, and not much. So that actually helps me, you know, not getting lost. But a couple of a very, I, I have a 10 minute track that actually I had. Really? To, yeah. But I, uh, what happened is that there was a, it was a loose, stupid jam I did while I was, was high. So it was. <laughs> Uh, but it had some ideas that actually were the basis for three or four different tracks now. So uh, 
I can't release it as such because there's nothing to release. But a lot of aspect actually ended up in other things. Well, okay, so you had said, this isn't verbatim, but you had said, fuck dysphoria and fuck cis normalization. Does that sound I, familiar? I exist, something like this. Something like that. Uh, if I wish I could find it. Yeah, it said, uh, sorry, but I exist. No matter how uncomfortable you may feel, I'm valid and I deserve to be heard. And um, I exist and I'm proud. And uh, fuck dysphoria, fuck cis normalization, fuck all of this, I exist. To all my uh, male to female transitioning sisters, fuck chasers, honestly, and fuck turfs, people. You know, H HRT is a great thing, and um, be free. There's nothing sensational about that, you know. But uh, I don't. I love that, and you know, you fit so much into. Could you know Twitter? You only have uh, how many characters? Two hundred and eighty or something like that. Uh, so I guess yeah. Um. So if you had more characters. Can you elaborate on what you're saying? This, um, I know since I started uh, transitioning that uh, some people around me uh, would be uncomfortable, especially with my physical changes. I was prepared to that. Uh, it would be naive to f think that it wouldn't have happened. I have a lot of people that support me around, but I know many of them are uncomfortable. And then I knew, I learned about it, uh, weeks and months afterwards 
that they were uncomfortable and they didn't want to tell me about it because they were afraid of something. And, um, and I felt that because socially people won't be, maybe they're not transphobic, maybe they're not homophobic, but they can be awkward around that because they have they don't have necessarily the information or maybe it's new in their life sometimes you are the first lgbt people they meet in front of them or maybe you are first of all uh, an example that they have that's more closer to them than before um, and they don't know what to do about it and i know some people who are having trouble especially with my physical transformation and i was and uh, the phone stopped ringing and that's something that happened to a lot of transgender people. Suddenly, people don't want to be, uh, you know, homophobic and everything, but they want—they don't want to walk on eggshell when they talk to you. So that way, they prefer, you know, to uh, make your friendship or relationship on pause just for the time for them to get used to it, to that new reality, especially for your new name and stuff. And uh, I can say I understand, but at the same time, fuck it. At the same time, fuck it, because that uh, the planet is... Uh, I own this planet as much as anyone else living on that planet. It's my planet. Uh, I deserve to be there. I'm born there. Uh, that world I belong to, if you want it or not. If you don't like it that I'm in this world, me uh, being a male to female, transgender girl, fine for you live your life but you have to know that it's not because you don't like me or anything that i'm going to disappear there are a lot of people like me that exist we deserve to exist and we will exist if you uh, whether you like it or not so fuck everybody that actually give us a hard time and don't let us live that's the thing live and let live that's pretty much what you should do when you have people telling you you know uh, transgender people shouldn't do that and that why the fuck do, are you bothered about that? What does it change for you? <laughs> I mean, when people have some trouble, yeah, I won't hire him because he's black. And so what? He's not going to stop being black if you don't hire him? What the fuck does that mean? People are not going to stop being gay because you beat them? It's not going to convince anybody. You're just going to be an asshole and you're just going to make that planet more miserable than it was before you came and did your action. So since that planet, I own it as much as anyone else. And that's how you should see stuff. Uh, I am valid. I do exist. I'm an example of something that exists. And that's it. So be it. So I shouldn't be, you know, I'm not necessarily proud about it, but I'm not ashamed about it. I shouldn't feel ashamed. That's the thing. And uh, I don't think anyone should be ashamed of what, who they are gender wise or sexually wise especially in all the lgbt movement when you try to shame those people it doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. why well i mean why don't you want gays to be married fuck what what's your problem so what what is it going to change to your life and to your marriage nothing you have some people that actually needs the gender transition so that they can finally be somewhat in a working against their own gender dysphoria that they are experiencing fine for them you know they still are the same person i still make the same music i still read the same book i still talk the same talk the thing is that just i'm changing physically mm. so and it's nothing political it's just about myself so yeah i'm valid the thing is that i don't want to be silenced and i want to acknowledge yes i am uh, it's not a secret uh, it's not what defines me. I'm way more than that, but yes, I am. And I won't deny it. So yeah, that's why maybe I wrote that message because you have to empower yourself and actually, uh, especially with women uh, in many scenes and for transgender women and transgender guy, um, that's uh, also a very a different ballpark of difficulty that you got. And we need to show each other strength and support and say, hey, you know what? I exist. I'm 34 year old. This is where I live. And uh, I'm living my life like I want it to be lived. Mm -hmm. And it is possible. It's nice actually to see some 20 year old because I would have loved to see that myself when I was there, their age, you know, or teenager that somebody could show me, hey, you know, it's 
I, I'm not a freak. I don't have weird ID. I can have a career. I can have actually uh, friends. I can live in a nice city. I can be comfortable. I can make great music for myself. You know, I can do it and I exist. You know, it's just to show uh, that's the idea of pride, you know, that a lot of people don't understand. This is why we do it. It's not for ourselves. It's not narcissistic like some people think it is. It could be, but that's not the point. The point is actually to show people that are not walking with us or that are not out. Hey, there are people here that exist that are so diverse and that could welcome you if you need some help. Um, but know that you're valid too. So, so that's the thing. You own the planet as much as I do. That, that's true. So wh whoever you are, David, whatever, whatever language you speak, whatever are your hobbies on anything, it exists. And that's the thing I have to, everybody just has to accept that. Hey, David exists. So that's it. Yes. You know? Don't do anything about it. There's nothing to do about it. Just integrate that in your mind. Right. That person exists. And that's it. Just live your life, but know that it exists. So that's the thing that actually I think will get better. I mean, it seems so simple. It's so funny that there's so much conflict. Of course, there is so much conflict. Your neighbor most of the time is an asshole. There's <laughs> no. a law of neighbor. Because his grass is greener. <laughs> Fuck you. I'm, I know you pent your grass. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what you were saying in the beginning, let's let's pretend, okay, Game Genie Sokolov and myself, we've been friends for for as long as I can remember. And so, it's, yeah. uh, and then you start transitioning and you were saying people stop calling you. So let's say mm -hmm. I stop calling you. I stop ringing your phone. What do you think it is? Me as a cis person, what do you think it is that I'm nervous about? Why am I not calling you? What, what, what is it that I don't want to say to you? They're not just, it's just not necessarily people that are in bad faith or bad, or that means bad. Um, in that case, if they don't call me back, fine by me um it's the people that actually matter to me that knew me for a long time and sometime that i've opened up a bit about this if some of them are surprised some of my friends saw it coming from uh, for two for three or four years they saw it coming actually my ex-boyfriend did see it coming because he was there we were living together or the friends did but what can i say i mean if someone is uncomfortable whatever i do will make them uncomfortable because it won't change their perception. But one thing they just need is contact. You know, it's like with whatever community you don't know, you just need to be in contact about it and that's it. After a while, you just realize, hey, you know, that's, uh, it's just a human being, you know, it just, or it's different, but you know, it's a, it's a human being. So it, uh, it's not necessarily complicated. It hurts. That's the, that's the thing that actually hurts a lot of people that are transitioning is that sometimes the social circle actually uh, is shrinking a lot. Sometimes it's their own family that disown them. So this is kind of tough. Uh, and sometimes they are in a situation where they won't be able to find a job or anything because people would be uncomfortable just because they are here. Um, and that's nothing we can do about, but we can actually, because whatever we say, uh, you will have the counter argument that I have the freedom to hire who I want and to be around people that makes me comfortable too, which is right. So how to react? The only reaction you can have is just let it be, mm. to let it go. That's the only sane situation you can have. You, you, of course, you're going to have uh, some nights where you're going to ask yourself, did I make the right decision? Because now a lot of people aren't talking to me. Are they going to be able to switch calling me this name to, to my name? Uh, are some people in the street going to stop one day to call me uh, sir, to call me madam, like they do sometime? Well, you can work on it as much as you like. It's never going to be at the rhythm that you want and it's never going to be 100% perfect for the rest of your life. And you know you have to live with that reality. That some people would just disappear from your life. And um, some of the people would just stop communication with you because of that. But that happens with anybody who is in a minority and people just discover that they are part of the minority and they didn't have the information before because of bias and everything. It happens to everybody. Uh, except if people didn't know that you were black in that case seriously how uh, like, <laughs> are you blind or anything I don't know that could work. but 
for people changing gender well reclaiming their gender it's more complicated because people associate gender with roles you know with a, uh, the role of society of what a male and female should behave look like talk express themselves do or not do uh, there's a lot of bias on that of course uh, because of education society everything and the fact that people coming from different countries make those things even more different. And with the internet, the lines are blurred because there's a lot of line everywhere. People will be uncomfortable because they don't know how to react to a new reality that now exists in front of them and they only read about it online or something that was far away or freakish to them. Mm. And then suddenly, you're not the human being, you become the representation of this idea. And they are afraid that you're going to come with troubles. And um, you can't just scream at them, uh, especially when they are in good faith. Because I know that some of my friends are not transphobic at all. They just needed a bit of time. Now they called me back. It took me uh, four or five months, and now they talk to me and everything. It just you, for people who are transitioning, be ready for that. You may have a period uh, where you're going to feel very lonely. Please find some family, find some friends to confide to, or find some uh, shelter, maybe if you need that. Find anyone that you can talk to, even on Discord or, or, or anything. Find a community. Don't be alone, because that's the thing that actually uh, can drive you mad and drive you crazy. Maybe you are valid and everything, but the world needs to take time to get used to you being around them. Not because of who you are and who you represent, but just because you now this the look they have on you will change. Mm. Like every time you come out. Yeah, you know, when you come out to people the first time and when they don't know, of course they have a reaction and you know that they're gonna behave differently sometime. We get used to. Sometimes it's striking, sometimes it's uh, very um, very calmly. Uh, you know about that too. So um, in our cases, it's more complicated. Because especially since if you didn't have accomplished transition at an early age. Because it can, it can sh dysphoria can be very uh, hit on. can very hit on you. Just call. Everybody's alone these days because of the pandemic. Just call anyone mm. that you haven't reached out for some time. Just just reach out, you know, they're, they're in the same situation as you, you know, there's, they are home, they're not doing anything, they go to work, they have to stay there, uh, restaurants are pretty much closed everywhere, uh, you know, concert places and stuff, that sucks, so try to reach out, maybe they have nothing to do, maybe they need to break out a bit of their habit, that's it, that's the only thing you can do, just reach out. And don't be afraid to ask questions, people. If you have somebody that, uh, you know, is transitioning around you, uh, if you feel you are too awkward to ask questions, you know, find someone on one time. Uh, don't be afraid. Uh, of course, we're not going to be your Wikipedia uh, answer <laughs> at all. And, uh, and since transition is a very individual thing, like uh, being LGBT in general, you're not going to have a universal answer. Right. Um, but you can have some perspective. Uh, don't treat me then as the transgender one, you know, I'm a transgender, uh, but I'm a woman. That's how I want to be talked about, just as a woman. That's it. Um, I'm not denying my past and all, but uh, it's still my past. That's the thing. As long as people are okay with it, it's nice. Just be nice, people, please. <laughs> Stop making war. Have sex with one another, with one another. You know. <laughs> Please do. You know, male, oh female. God. That's it. As long as you're adult and consenting. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my, I get nervous. I get nervous sometimes with our politics, but uh, don't be. Oh, I do. I get nervous. You think it's better in Canada? Oh my god, (laughs) I don't know what I, you know, we can only look, I can only look at Canada and say, wow, they look nice. Is it, is it bad there? Uh, Prime Minister, uh, federal Prime Minister, because I have two of them one in Quebec and one in uh, in the in Ottawa. Is uh, Justin Trudeau? Is, there are some scandals uh, surrounding some people around him. Oh wow! So um, yeah, and the difference is that in Canada, even a small scandal can make a government uh, fall. Uh, because contrary to uh, England and United States, for example, or even France, in Canada we have something called having some standards. So uh, we have some standards for prime minister. So when he's below that standards, we're actually pretty unforgiving. Oh, no. So that's, uh, that's the difference. <laughs> we're pretty unforgiving. You know, we want a prime minister to look like very squeaky clean. Not because they deserve it, but because, you know, we just say, ah, you know, who's going to be the Canadian at the G7 summit? And we say... Okay, this one can look the part. Oh my God. Go on, say your stuff. Please don't <laughs> dress up all the time, man. Please don't, because that's the thing we have against Trudeau is because he was dressing up all the time in the, you know, all the foreign uh, traveling. And uh, we were, everyone collectively, we were watching our foot saying, Oh, oh really? <laughs> was he embarrassed? Justin, please. Oh, no. A bit. You know, the costume, the Indian costume when he got to India, you know, oh, yeah. that was. That was something that the blackface situation. Yeah, oh, we understand yes, yes, was, yes. We understand it was 20 years ago. It was young and he changed. And we, we understand that. But still, it's very funny to see it happens to him out of everyone. Wow. <laughs> because he, he has such this message of tolerance. And I really think he does. Uh, I really don't have any problem believing that at all. For real, no sarcasm here. I think he's a great man. But yeah, he had the yao. He, he was young one day, and uh, he did those things that nowadays we shock him. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that make us laugh. In the latest Borat movie, they actually show the picture <gasps> in the beginning of the movie of Trudeau. Oh, I haven't seen it. I want to where... see it. Oh my god! <laughs> Please do. It's fun. It's very fun. Why didn't um? Uh, oh, uh, what's his name? He uh, <laughs> he's more of the progressive party in Canada. Uh, Jagmeet Singh? Yeah, Singh. Why? Why didn't? Why didn't Singh win the election? Wasn't it supposed to be close? No, he's in the NDP. The NDP is the third party uh, in Canada, pretty much. Uh, in the federal government, you have, we have many uh, political parties. You have the Green Party. It's small. You have the the NDP, Neo Democrats. Uh, you have the Liberal Party, and you have the Conservative Party. Uh, the Conservative Party originally was two party, the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada and uh, another one. And um, so it's a, it's not a big structure. Uh, the NDP was always third. Uh, they managed to be second once uh, years ago because they have a very good leaders. Uh, it just in Canada, you have to realize we're not really a country. We have a very, we don't have a lot of people living in Canada. First of all, mm. we are not even barely. We have 36 million people. We are the second biggest country in the planet uh, in terms of size. You know, you have to realize that there's almost nobody. Just in Quebec, uh, there's just eight million people. That's it. So it's very small, and most of us lives uh, down south. There's almost no one north. But it's so different because the communities are very have a lot of geographical spacing between each other. Wow. We don't talk a lot. We don't communicate a lot. I have nothing in common except the money uh, and the common prime minister with someone living in British Columbia, someone living in Alberta. Uh, maybe someone from Ontario because they are our neighbors, but that's it. I have more in common with people from New York and Vermont than people from British Columbia. So... When you want to become the Prime Minister of Canada, it's very complicated because you need to have an image that will appease everybody, wow. people that are extremely diverse. So it's not an easy choice. Most of the time, they are they barely have the majority in the in the parliament because that's how our system works. It's a legislative system. And um, so it keeps them in check. And there's a lot of debates and uh, you have a, some alliance between parties and everything. And DP never really had uh, some leader 
that could actually appeal to such a broad different people across the country, no matter what they say. And also they have way, way less money than the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party to make campaign. So they have some provinces that they are good on that level, but on the federal level, it's going to be difficult. Wow. But I voted for them. It is kind of interesting. I, I, I feel like what, how you're describing, like I, I feel like that way about America. Like I know what we have is New England. So like where I am, there's like Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire. And we all kind of, I think, think, mm. think um, the same. And then, but then there's the rest of the country, which is like the South and there's the mid. Mm -hmm. And I don't know these people. I have no, I don't know. I don't feel like I know them at all, but we're in the same country. And sometimes I wish the country was a little smaller, <laughs> like in Europe where yeah. they have smaller countries. It just makes more sense to me. I don't know. Uh It makes sense, actually, but in, in this way, you need to have a government that's not centralized at all, and that gives a lot of power to actually local government, especially in the the town system, you know. We have right. the munis uh, municipal system, and then we have the provincial system, and then we have the federal system. The federal government pretty much don't do a lot of stuff. They don't have a lot of power. Um, they have a, a tax that goes to all the country, and then they redistribute it for some project like highway because that's federal but things like education or medicine uh, that's provincial level we don't have the same thing uh, depending on the province where you live so you don't even live the same right. same as america but the thing is that in canada we have a uh, bonus uh, it's actually the two languages uh, that add some complexity <laughs> and misunderstanding uh, sadly it does it adds a lot of misunderstanding really Uh, the, uh, Canada is a country that's bilingual as long as you're French speaking. If you're English speaking, they don't give a fuck about being bilingual, I can tell you, because they don't need to. Because they have American media to listen to. They have uh, English media to listen to. They have Canadian English to listen to. They have uh, English speaking abundance of media and cultural product to use. And they don't have a lot of French speaking people living near them so they don't have to but the thing is that in quebec we have to because the official language of the province it's not the same as the federal government is french only so it means wow. that official documents will be sent to you in french in quebec not anywhere else uh, anywhere else there would be in english only so it's supposed to be a bilingual country in most cases it's not true french-speaking people know how to speak english The opposite, most of the time, is not true because they don't have to. So um, it's kind of complicated because it can create not resentment, but definitely miscommunication and misunderstanding because there's that barrier of a language and expression coming between the spontaneity, you know, of uh, exchange and uh, friendship. So it gets in the way. So the, there's that aspect that's actually very important in our life here. Yeah. It's so interesting hearing about, you know, how you picture something versus how it is. Well, we have a problem in Canada. People think that we are very nice and uh, it's a very tolerant country and everything. But we, we're... the truth is uh, we are very much okay with the idea that the world has that image of us. It's fine. Okay, We're not going to complain. Uh, in reality... Uh... Uh, we have every problem that every country has, but maybe to a lesser degree. Uh, don't think we don't have racism in Canada. We do. Don't think we don't have a homophobia existing. It does in some places. That's true. Don't think we have uh, full employment. We have unemployment to some degree, too. But the thing is that we're a smaller community and people are more to the live and let live uh, mentality. So that actually it's uh, way more balanced to have a quality of life. Uh, also, it's a more socialist economy, so you need to, <laughs> to like it. Well, you know, it means that the state is definitely has a hand in organizing the way society behaves. Um, is it... Uh, <sighs> You need to like this idea or not. Right. Uh, we're free to do whatever we like, and uh, we're pretty much all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right, last question for real. Last question for real. I'm just curious. How do you view America? Or the United uh, States? Sorry, sense. the United States. The, the United States. The country is a fantastic country to look at, probably to live in, uh, because it's extremely diverse. That's true. And uh, it's a country that there's almost no ceiling. 
I mean, if you want to be a, a billionaire, yeah, maybe you will have the tool to do that. Uh, but if you fall, you're going to fall hard. You know, in Canada, we have the idea, you know, yeah, we're paying more taxes so that actually uh, poor people and people who can't afford, you know, insurance or security can have a shelter or something. That means that maybe we're preventing the higher hubs to get higher so that we can actually distribute it more evenly. But we're OK to live as we are. America has ambition. That's the, the picture that he has of, of a country, you know, of an entrepreneur of people that actually wants to be something and uh, actually, you know, live a life. That being said, um, uh, I'm, I will make the distinction between the political America and the uh, day-to-day America that uh, I come to visit with my friends, the music, you know, all the culture that it can provide, all the melting pot and everything. That, that's something that's actually very nice to have. I mean, there's such a variety of genre, especially music-wise in the United States. That's great. Politically, uh, you guys suck. Uh, th- that, uh, I'm serious. I mean, that's um, w- whatever the party, whatever the, you know, if it's governors, if it's the Senate, if it's the, the chambers, if it's the president, if it's just the office, it's not even about the people, just the structure of it. It's old, guys. Uh, it's very old. Maybe some overall would be needed <laughs> because you have end, never-ending debate between people that are pretty much you know, engaging for the same. They are old. They are most of the time out of line with the reality of what's happening. What's going on? I mean, you guys deserve better. For real, you are a great country. You deserve better than all of those guys. Whatever. I'm not even talking about Democrats or Republicans. Really, all of them. Uh, it's this small. I don't say that in Canada we have great politicians and everything. No, we don't. But they're actually more appropriate for the way we live. <laughs> so um, at least, you know, it's manageable. You know, we keep them in check saying, yeah, we know you lie. We know you're stupid. So please shut up. And that would be all right for you and us. But, but you know, that may, maybe that, that's the... Po- in fact, that's the thing that we hear the most about America since a couple of years. It's mainly about the political aspect of things uh, instead of the cultural uh, creation aspect. And that's too bad because it actually focused the shift to a negative image overall. And uh, that could be impacted to people. American people are not responsible for that. I don't think so. Not at that scale. It's just that it's a system that uh, maybe is losing some steam and may need some uh, a coat of fresh paint. Uh, maybe be changed a bit altogether. I don't know. That I don't know nice. what's the good solution. I like that. But the thing is that f- from outside, yeah, we uh, we are a bit sorry about the the state of the country seems to be, um, especially with the COVID situation. And this is the thing that actually there is about America. A lot of people are still looking up to it. It's true. Um, and uh, the, the thing that people maybe want to say to America is just don't let us down. You know, if, if we actually have this image of you, live up to the image, don't show us those politicians uh, taking the center stage and being just awful, you know, uh, all around. Those are not good role models. You have good musicians, good painters, good writers and everything. Those are good. Those could, uh, could actually win the world way more easily by the culture <laughs> aspect of thing, I think, than uh, by those people trying to make policies and just annoying the shit out of us on a daily basis. <laughs> so, does that answer your question? That is perfect. I love it. You it's are very so complicated. Good. What do you think about Canada yourself? Um, I think about, well, what I think about Canada is that, um, is that I look up to you because of the, because of the government. I think we are, uh, I think Americans are ambitious and, and, uh, we are, you know, it's a dog eat dog country. You gotta like hustle here and I'm sure you have to hustle everywhere, but, but, you know, we don't, maybe we hustle in ways that other people don't have to because, Mm -hmm we don't have socialized health insurance so you have to figure that out and um we're not protected especially like right now i see other countries i see canada getting everyone's getting two thousand dollars a month france i know is getting and we did we we don't have any more oh it's gone 
I want to know well, that. Well, it's tough because the, the, the state is in a huge deficit now. And uh, actually, we are in a very dire situation. Uh, oh, no, I didn't know that. To save the country. Yeah, we have the CERB. It's the Canadian Emergency Relief uh, Fund. It was a check that was sent to people that actually lost their job or their, their revenue because when COVID be, was impacted. Because otherwise, our economy will just disappear. A lot of us works because of uh, import and export, especially with the United States. And uh, when suddenly borders are closed and um, the price, you know, inflation will start up and a lot of people won't have money to buy their rent or everything. We don't want to destroy the country. We can't do that. So the state decided, you know, we're going to we're going to pay. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a terrible situation, but at least it's going to be a terrible situation right now. And then we're going to pay for it back later. But it's going to be way, way much worse if we let, you know, companies crash, people getting employment, you know, having a 20% rate of unemployment, mm. uh, closing immigration, stopping export and imports. No, that, that wouldn't be a sustainable at all. Uh, so they just took that decision. Let's help the people. And we'll see afterwards what to do. So it was a tough decision, but it was a good one. So we were surprised that he actually uh, that he actually had the balls to do that. But that was good. That that was very needed. But the socialized aspect, you know, the, it depends on the province you live. In Quebec, it's actually quite okay for auto insurance for um, uh, to get your medicine insurance uh, or health in general. But the thing is that you pay more taxes here mm-hmm. because of that. Yeah. And then you pay way, way less for tuition, for example. So, uh, but that aspect is that we send way more people, you know, to upper uh, studies. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so to universities and all. So because of that, we have a, a province that actually was way, way more creative uh, than the rest of the country. Oh, because, because that's where the actually- education is? because of the education aspect is actually wow. way more affordable and way more universal. You could maybe do it better by being free by yourself and it's not the thing doing it. That's true. But for some people, that's not the case. So that's the compromise that we find in our society. So uh, we're not forced to do anything. Maybe we try to, to help people that are more disadvantaged than us. Um, because if they fall, uh, we're going to pay anyway. So let's not make people fall. And you don't want to fall. Right. You know, it could happen to all of us. So we want to protect that. So it's, um, where can, where can people find you? At home. Uh, on the, <laughs> you, can, you can try Tinder if you're in the Montreal area. Uh, <laughs> I got an only fan. No, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, Instagram, uh, you can get me on SoundCloud, on MixCloud, on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, uh, Bandcamp, mostly these days, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, well, pretty much everywhere, everywhere. Um, just go and uh, just send a message if you want to share some tracks that you did or if you're looking to be booked for a chiptune show and you don't have the connections or uh, if you just want to talk about gay stuff, I'm absolutely okay with it. Please, uh, yeah. <laughs> please do. I like it. 